Now we're turning back again to Mark chapter 12. We'll just bow together in a word of prayer and seek the help of God as we come to consider it, that the Lord would apply his word to our hearts with with great blessing. Let's, Let's pray. Lord, we do need thy help in a great measure tonight as we come afresh to your word. We thank you for blessings already received today as we've spent time in your presence. We thank you, Lord, for help that has already been given. We thank you for your faithfulness already demonstrated to us in numerous ways. But we look to thee to come again into our midst with life-giving power through the word. We praise you that the preaching of the gospel, while it is foolishness to many, yet it is the power of God unto salvation. And we do do ask, O Lord, that you would use it to that end. Lord, you see our hearts. And where there is that need of salvation, of surrender unto Christ, we pray that you would grant such grace that is needed to turn from our own ways unto the Lord. Be pleased to minister then to the hearts of each one, saved or unsaved. Apply the word with great benefit and show us the Savior in whose name we ask it. Amen. Uh, At the end of Mark chapter 11, you had this delegation from the highest Jewish court, the Sanhedrin. And they had come to Christ while he was walking in the temple. They had come with the intention of trapping him with a question that had no right answer. By what authority do you do these things? Casting out the money changers, overthrowing the market trading, and his general teaching too, uh, undoubtedly. And if the Savior had answered by claiming direct authority from God then he was in danger of being stoned there and then as a blasphemer to just have the arrogance to take it to himself, uh, authority from God. Of course, he did have the right to do that, but he would have been uh, seen as a blasphemer, perhaps, to have taken that answer. If, on the other hand, he had claimed to have done all these things in his own authority as an independent man, he would have been charged with rebellion in God's house, and again, the outcome wouldn't have been good. But Christ had silenced them. He had wisely reversed the whole thing so that this delegation of chief priests, scribes, and elders became caught in their own trap. They were asked the simple question, is John the Baptist's ministry, is his baptism, is it of heaven or is it of men? If it's of heaven, well then Jesus Christ is Lord because John, if he ministered in heaven's authority, testified of Christ, the Son of God. If they said his authority was only of man, Well, they were in danger of being stoned themselves because everyone held that John was a prophet. So they had been rendered speechless. They could give no answer to the Savior's question at all. And Christ did not let things go at that point. He pressed home his advantage. And he did so by telling the parable that we've read together in this chapter 12. It's the story of a man who plants his vineyard, puts hedges around it, digs a wine press, builds a tower, does all the work so that this vineyard is in perfectly good order, and then he leaves it in the care of husbandmen while he goes into a far country. Now, it's a parable that was designed in its original context to to cut these religious leaders to their heart, to expose their corruption in failing to serve the Lord, and especially their corruption in abusing the position of authority that God had given them. But it's also a parable that is very relevant to each one of us as we live our lives before the Lord. And I trust you'll be able to see that tonight as we consider this portion. We're looking this evening at husbandmen in God's vineyard. Husbandmen in God's vineyard. Now, first of all, let's think about their responsibility. At the beginning of this parable, this illustrative story that the Savior was telling, you have the owner of the vineyard, And he's done everything you could possibly want to be done. His vineyard is in good shape, immaculate condition. It is well prepared to bear good fruit. A certain man planted a vineyard, set a hedge about it, digged a place for the wine fat and built a tower. All is done. It has a hedge or a wall around it, giving it protection from robbers. It has an area especially dug where the grapes can be trod upon and squeezed to give out their juice. It even has a a tower so that dangers can be seen from a distance. Everything is in good condition, without defect. And then the owner places this vineyard into the hands of husbandmen. 
while he travels to a far country. Now, you read in the text there in verse 1 that he, he let it out to husband men and went into a far country. Now, I think that word, it, it can be used with the idea of renting out some land, but that's not how it's being used here. We're not to think of this as him renting the land to the people. The idea is more of him leaving the land in their care. He, he's not handing this land over to the husband men to do as they please with it. No, he's placing it in their care, and he's doing so with the intention that at the appropriate time, they are going to give him the fruit of their labor. You can see that very easily because he starts to send servants asking for the fruit. So he's not just renting this land out for them to do as they please. He's putting it in their care with the expectation that they are going to return fruit, the, the fruit of the vineyard, onto him. He's, he's placing the vineyard in the care of his servants who are going to tend to that vineyard. So the point is that it's placed in their care. They have a responsibility over it. They have a, a duty to attend to. They've been given this thing and they have to labor faithfully in the vineyard to do well with the responsibility that their Lord has given them. Now, in its context, Christ gives the parable to remind these Jewish leaders of their responsibility. If you remember last week, we were talking about this delegation that had come to Christ, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. This was a delegation from the Sanhedrin, the highest Jewish court. These were people who had authority and who had responsibility. God had put them in that position over Jewish religion. A religion which God had established, a good religion, a Christ-centered religion. The Judaism of Christ's day and the Judaism that we still know today is an apostate one. But the Judaism that God had established was Christ-focused. It was all directed towards the Messiah that God would provide, the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Old Testament saints of God were looking forward to his coming. The one who would give himself for them. The one who would be marred more than any man, as Isaiah prophesied. The one whom it would please the Lord to bruise so that his people might be forgiven. So God had established a good religion. And it pointed towards the Savior. It would bring glory to his name. God had established a religious system that would be a way of men approaching unto God as they used means of sacrifice to look to the Savior. This system would be shining as a light in the midst of a dark world, pointing the nations onto the true and living God. And it's placed in the care of these leaders. Right throughout history, different individuals had been responsible for upholding godliness. In Christ's day, the baton had passed to these leaders, to the Sanhedrin, these men who currently were in position of authority. <laughs> and they had a responsibility to use that authority, to use that position in the right way for the glory of God. Now we can also, we'll come back to those Jewish leaders, but before we move on, we can also apply this to ourselves. Because taking the parable and narrowing it into an individual level, just the, the basic principle here, you can think of the responsibility that the Lord of the vineyard gave to these husband men, and you ought to be reminded of the responsibility that God has given you as an individual who stands before him. The Lord has created you in his image. That's true of every man, every woman. We're created in the image of God. And the fact that you are created in the image of God means that you are given a great responsibility. As an image bearer of God, you are to live a life that brings glory to his name. You are meant to stand in creation as something of a shining light, showing all of creation the glory of God. Being an image bearer of God, we're meant to be reflections of him, directing all attention onto our creator, our God. There's responsibility there. We're to live lives that bring glory to his name. God had put this vineyard, uh, uh, rather the Lord uh, here in the parable had put this vineyard into the care of husband men and he would, be, he would be looking for fruit at the appointed season. Well, if you like, God has put your life into your care 
God has given you responsibility to use your life in the right way. However long it lasts, whether it's a life of just a few years, whether it's 80 or 90 or 100 years, God has given you a life here and now to use in the right way. And he's looking for fruit. He's looking for fruit. You know, just as this vineyard was given over in perfect condition, so God made man in a perfect condition. He made our first parents, Adam and Eve, in such a way that there was nothing lacking. There was no fault. There was no defect in the slightest. They were perfectly fitted to bring glory to God. We were created with perfect righteousness, with holiness, with goodness. We had a right knowledge of God, a right knowledge of the world around us. We had a heart to love the Lord. We, he made us perfectly. He put us in a perfect creation. Nothing more could be wanted. And I suppose the point is, there could be no excuse for failure. God is looking for fruit. At the appointed season, as it were, he sends the servant out to collect the fruit. He's given you a life to serve him, and he's looking for fruit from that life. He's looking for that life to be used and managed in the right way for his glory. So applying it to ourselves, here's the challenging question. Are you managing the, the vineyard that God has put into your care in the right way? Are you using the authority that God has given you over your own life for his glory? Or are you using it merely for yourself? There's a great responsibility placed upon these husbandmen. And there is a great responsibility placed upon you and upon me as well. Will we use the life that God has given in the right way for his glory instead of our own um, pleasures and desires and whatever brings um, ease to us? Will we use it for him? Because ultimately, he's the creator. Your life belongs to him. My life belongs to him. The responsibility. Notice then with this parable, the rebellion of these husbandmen. Their rebellion. They've been left in a position of great responsibility. And eventually the time came that the master sent a servant to collect the fruit from the year's labor. But did the husbandmen give what was due? No. Verse, verse 3 tells us that when the servant arrived, they caught him and beat him. And sent him away empty. Now what a, what a disgraceful thing to be done. To a servant who has been sent by their rightful Lord. The one who has left this vineyard in their care. It really is amounting to a complete disregard for their Lord's authority. It amounts to a rebellion from his rule. These husbandmen in beating the servant. They were effectively telling the master of the vineyard. That it is now our vineyard. You can have nothing to do with it. You don't deserve the fruit of it. No, it's ours. We're going to do with it as we please. You've got no claim upon it. This was a, a wicked rebellion. Now, I suppose Christ's primary point, again, going back to the setting here, was that that is exactly what the religious leaders of the day had done. God had placed them in a position of responsibility over his people, over his religion, over his temple. But instead of returning fruit onto him, instead of glorifying the Lord, they had been abusing it for their own profit. We saw something of that recently. The temple itself was to be a house of prayer for the nations. But these religious leaders had turned it into a den of thieves. It had become a money-making racket for themselves to line their own pockets rather than to bring glory onto the Lord. They had abused their authority. They had rebelled from God. Fruits of righteousness should have been springing up onto God, not only from the Israelites, but from others too, as they gathered, even drawn in by the light of the gospel going out from this place. And yet the chief priests had twisted it into something that was really just for their own good. Who cares if God's name is in the gutter? As long as their pockets are full, they're using the temple to serve their own agenda. Likewise, the Pharisees, they had lifted up their various extra rules so as to bring glory not so much onto God, but to themselves, to, to lord it over the average people, to be lifted up in pride, to have the place of respectability in society. Judaism had been twisted into something that was no longer glorifying to God, but rather 
into something man-made and something that was man-serving. What a rebellion. And that's the point Christ is making here to them. They've rebelled. They've abused the authority that God had given them. But before we give them too hard a time, we ought to bring it back to ourselves again. Because have we not done the very same thing? As you think of the life that God has given you, the, if you like the vineyard God has placed in your care, have we not done the very same thing? God has given you a life. He's breathed breath into you. You became a living soul. He has a, appointed you a, a season of health and strength and energy with which you're able to serve him and give your all for him. He has made you to stand in the midst of creation as his image bearer, pointing glory to your creator, living out your chief purpose to glorify God. That's what Adam was doing at the very first in the Garden of Eden, living for the glory of God. But do we not all have to confess that that's not what we've done? Instead, we've, we've miserably failed in our duty. Instead of using your life to serve the Most High God, you've lived for self. You've lived for your own comforts, for your own pleasures. You've lived according to your own ambitions and your desires. And you've even done so when it means defying God. I know it's true of you because it's true of all of us. Our parents took the first step. Adam and Eve took the forbidden fruit. They chose to go their way. They cho chose to be lords of their own lives instead of pleasing God. And we followed hot on their heels. We've chosen our way. We've chosen to live life for ourselves instead of for God. What is the sum of the law of God? What is it that God requires of us? What is it that God would have us to do when he creates us? Well, it is that we love him with all. Now, that's a demanding word, with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength, with all, with every fiber of our being exerted for him and for his glory. But instead, like these husbandmen before us and even like the chief priests and the Scribes and elders and so on. Have we not lived for self? For sin? Taken what God has given us and used it for our own agenda and served our own lusts rather than serving our God? Rebellion. Rebellion. Now let's move on in the parable and you can think of their resistance as well. The resistance of these husbandmen. You know, how, how patient the Lord of the vineyard is in Christ's parable. You think of the dreadful thing that's been done. He's put this vineyard in their care. He has sent a servant to come and to collect what is due to him. And they have beaten that servant and sent him away empty-handed. What a, what a dreadful thing to be done. And yet, the Lord of the vineyard is very patient. Instead of immediately coming with an army to destroy these husband men, uh, verse 4 says that again, he sent on to them another servant. Here's another opportunity, another servant. And at him they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handed. And you would think to yourself, well, surely now, now's the time when he's going to judge these people. Now's the time when he's going to come and he's going to come with force to drive these men out of the garden to uh, perhaps even put them to death for their, for their sinfulness. But no, he's still patient. Again, he sent another. And they killed. And many more. Beating some and killing some. Time after time, the Lord of the vineyard has sent servant and servant and servant, seeking to bring these wicked husband men to their senses and turn them from their wicked ways. And time after time, his efforts are resisted. His efforts are resisted, in fact, with the utmost hostility, beating and wounding and killing his various servants. Now, again, the, very, the, the picture there, it's very pointed against the religious leaders in Jerusalem. I mean, this had been the case right throughout the history of Israel. That so often the religious establishment had become corrupted and God had to send numerous prophets in days of old giving warning after warning to the people calling them to turn from their ways calling them to 
to repent of their sin that was causing such harm in their lives. And yet, time after time, the people wouldn't take heed. You have one example in 2 Chronicles 24, where in a day of idolatry, Zechariah stood up and he gave the warning to the people, Thus saith God, why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. He stands with this great warning as a prophet of God. And what did he get for his labors? Well, they conspired against him and stoned him with stones. Israel had received so many chances to mend their ways. And these religious leaders had been given so many chances too to mend their ways. How many times these leaders had heard the word of, of, of God coming to them. Even think of John the Baptist's ministry as he turned to some of these people and told them to repent of their wicked ways. And they had stubbornly refused. Every warning has gone unheeded. In fact, they've rejected it with the utmost hostility. These men that Christ is speaking to now, they had despised John the Baptist, even though there was a man who had uh, told them right, who had urged them to repent, to turn from their wickedness. They despised him. They stubbornly resisted. Now, is that the case with you? I, I can't see your heart tonight, but is that the case with you? You might not have had a literal prophet of God coming to you. You might not have had the opportunity to kill or stone a literal prophet of God. Never mind actually performing that deed. But is there the same stubborn heart of resistance within you? You might not have had the literal prophets standing in front of you, but they have been testifying. In fact, they've been testifying often because every time we open this book, we're reading that same word of God which he has given through his prophets of old. Holy men of old wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. As you open your Bible, you have these warnings of God coming to your soul. There in the word, God by his prophets shows the error of sinful ways. He shows what is expected of us. He sets a high standard and it is a high standard to love God with all our heart, with everything to turn from our folly and serve him with all of our might. He declares to us time and time again what is expected and how patient he has been in light of our rebellion. The Lord could have come very quickly to judge us, and yet he's given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. His word has come again and again and again. And he would seek to turn you from abusing the good gifts he's given? Are you still misusing the life God has given? Are you still robbing God of what is due to him? He shows you it in his word repeatedly that you might be humbled, that there might be grief over our folly, that we might turn, turn on to the Lord and render to him what is due. Have you turned to the Lord then? Do you have a heart that desires to serve the Lord? Do you have a heart that does long to live with all your might for the glory of your maker and your sustainer? Or do you still have a heart of rebellion, a heart that really is set on serving self? Do you have the same heart as those in Jeremiah's day of whom the Lord said, Jeremiah 5, 23, this people have, hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted. And gone. You know, as we think of the resistance of these husbandmen, to come back to Christ's parable, you really have the climax of their resistance. When the Lord of the vineyard, who has been very patient with these wicked servants, finally makes one last attempt to turn them, to win them back. Verse 6 tells us of that last great attempt. In verse 6, having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, they will reverence my son. And so the question is now, how are the husbandmen going to react to the son? This is the one who will inherit the vineyard. 
from his father. This is the one who being a son in the family has direct authority over these men who are but servants. He's not like a servant who, who was sent previously, who, who comes with the authority of another one. He comes with his own authority. He comes as a son. He comes as part of the family to demand that these husband men start using the family property in the right way. He'll inherit the vineyard. How, how will the husband men respond to him? Will they reverence him? Well, their rebellion comes to a climax with these with this dreadful response to their master's son in verse 7, those husband men said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. Verse 8 carries on, they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Now, the point was a forceful one as Christ made it to those Jewish leaders. At various times in his earlier public ministry, he had made the direct claim to be the Son of God. In John chapter 10, for example, Christ had claimed to be equal with his Father, and the Jews on that occasion were ready to stone him for blasphemy. There's plenty today who say that we've got it all wrong about Jesus Christ, that he never really claimed to be God, that we've just put that upon him, that really he was just a good prophet. No, he claimed to be God. The people of the day were ready to stone him because of blasphemy. And it would have been blasphemy, except for the fact that he truly was who he claimed to be. In John 10, he said, I am the son of God. He, they were going to stone him for saying, I am the son of God. The Jewish leaders knew what Christ was getting at here. He was emphasizing that though he had now come from his father, not just another prophet, but the well-beloved son, the one whom John testified of as the Son of God, the well-beloved. He had come, the Son, the one who had true authority over them, the one who was Lord of the temple that they had been abusing, the, the one who had authority to put matters right, the one to whom they ought to bow the knee. And yet they were wickedly rejecting him. In fact, his, his parable implies that they knew who he was. In the parable, you have the husband men conferring together and they're saying to themselves, this is the heir. They recognize who's coming. They recognize that it's not just another servant. They recognize this is the heir. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. If we kill that man's only son, he'll have no one else to give the vineyard to and then we can inherit it. We can have it for ourselves. These Jewish leaders surely recognized something special about the one who was in front of them. He taught with authority that was beyond anything known to the scribes. He wrought sign miracles which proved, who he, proved that he was who he claimed to be. He spoke with perfect wisdom. One of the greatest proofs surely was the fact that he lived an immaculate and pure life, free from sin. Sometimes there's a lot of hatred in the world because people have done wrong things. You know, murderers face hatred from society. Thieves face hatred from society. If someone tells you a lie, you're much more likely to have negative feelings toward them. Often our sins bring hatred upon us. But with Christ, he was the best person you would ever meet. He never wronged anyone throughout his whole life. He certainly never wronged these Jewish leaders. Now, he had some harsh words for them, which they deserved. But he never wronged them. He was compassionate where compassion was due. He was forgiving. He, he was virtually everywhere he went seeking to serve. Here was someone that ought to have been loved and appreciated. There was nothing in Christ that ought to cause hatred towards him. His life was pure. His life was immaculate, free of sin. And surely as they looked on at him, surely they saw the marks of one who was who he claimed to be. In fact, just to take you back to John chapter 10, the Savior challenged the Jews on that occasion in verse 36. In John 10, verse 36, he said, Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. That's it, they were challenging him. You've blasphemed, claiming this title, the Son of God. And then Christ went on, verse 37. If I do not do the works of my Father... Believe me not, 
But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. And Christ's point there was simple. He says, you don't believe what I claim. You don't believe that I'm the son of God as I claim to be. Look at my life. Look at the works that I do. Look at my conduct. Look at my character. It perfectly matches with the Father. If there's some flaw there, point it out. But there's not. It ought to have been clear as his life was examined. He was who he claimed to be. These religious leaders, they recognized something of that. They were not now rejecting him merely out of ignorance. This was not just misplaced zeal that really they have a heart for the Messiah, but, but actually they, they just have mistaken it and don't realize that it's Christ. No, this wasn't misplaced zeal. They were rejecting him because they were glad to have their place as lords over Israel, to have the inheritance to themselves, to be able to use it for their own ends. They had no desire to bow onto anyone, not even to the Son of God. They would take him, and very soon they would kill him. In fact, that was going to happen within a couple of days of these words being spoken. What a challenge it must have been to them when they had this parable stated, and it became clear that Christ knew their intentions because they were plotting how they would get rid of him. And Christ gives them this parable. They know it's about them, as you see from verse 12. They knew that he had spoken the parable against them. And he speaks of how these husbandmen plot together and decide to kill the heir. All of this is relevant to you and to me tonight as well. Because to bring you back to the point for us, God has given you a vineyard, as it were. He's given you a life. He expects that life to be used for his glory to be used for the purpose for which it was created. Now maybe, maybe you've been like these husband men and you've heard the warnings of God's word that your ways are not good, you're, you're not serving the Lord as you ought to be. Perhaps you've heard the call of scripture at different times that there is a need to repent and to pursue godliness, that you, you need to turn and honor the Lord. But the great test comes when you are confronted with Jesus Christ. There's the great test. What will you do with Jesus Christ? That's the question. In their day, the Pharisees and the scribes, the, the high priests, the elders, they were confronted with Jesus Christ. And they answered the question by putting him to death. They did not want anything to do with him. They would have, uh, no, uh, they would no, have no willingness to bow the knee to him. They would not give him time of day. They would put him to death. Tonight you have set before you the one who is crucified and living, the Savior of sinners, Jesus Christ. God sets his Son before you. When you were fruitless and bearing nothing for God, doing nothing with your life to honor the Lord, rather living for yourself, God sent forth his Son. Not just to step into your life and demand your service, although that's part of it, but also as the one who who went to the cross specifically to put away your guilt. That part isn't really covered in the parable because I suppose it wouldn't make sense when you're talking about a husband man sending his son to the vineyard. But that's the truth in the greater reality. God has sent his son not just to come and demand obedience. He does do that. And Christ does demand obedience. He does demand that the knee should bow. He does demand that the life should be surrendered to him. But he comes also as the one who puts away the guilt of the past. He comes as the one who, who willingly dies for the guilty. You and I have lived lives of rebellion against God. Even if you're saved tonight, there have been many, many rebellions throughout your history. Many times when the voice of God's servants, the voice of God's word came to your soul and has been sounding in your ears, calling you to the right path, but you've instead used your life wrongly. Used it for yourself. If you're unsaved, well, that marks the entirety of your life. You're still living that way. You're still refusing to bring honor to God with your life. That all brings guilt upon you. That all renders us deserving of wrath, deserving of judgment. And yet God sends his son not just to demand new obedience, although that's a big part of it, but also to die for the guilt of the past and the guilt of the present and the guilt of the future too. 
to die for all those rebellions that there have been, to die that they might be forgiven so that justice can be done and sin punished, but on him. And a sinner like you or me, go free. He died that guilty rebels who ought to have been serving God but have refused with stubborn hearts that we might be changed and made into something new, made into godly people with a new heart, with a new desire to truly live our lives for the Lord. Christ died. The Son of God came to us to accomplish these things. So we're confronted with the crucified and the risen Christ. He comes in a meeting such as this, and he shows his wounds. He shows that the work is done, that he can forgive sins, that he can forgive your rebellions, no matter how many there are, no matter how great they've been, he can forgive them. And he comes to call you to a new way of life. He comes like the son came to these husbandmen, telling you, take that vineyard and start using it for the glory of God as I give you strength. Come and give your life over into my hand. He comes as this last great attempt of God, the Father, to turn you from your ways onto him. And the question then is, what do you do with Jesus Christ? Do you bow the knee? Do you cry unto him for mercy, for forgiveness, for pardon, for help, as you now submit your life to God and, and seek to live for the glory of your maker? Will you by his help turn from your own ways to live your life as it should be lived for, for the Lord? Or do you reject him? And even in light of all that's been done at the cross, all that's been done as the Son of God has come to offer his salvation to you, do you still, as it were, put him to a fresh open shame, turning him aside, saying, I'll have nothing to do with you? What do you do with Jesus Christ? As the Father sends his well-beloved Son, are you willing to humble yourself before him? Or are you tonight engaged in that, in that climax of rebellion? turning aside from him? Do you bow the knee as he comes or do you despise him? What a solemn and dreadful thing it is to refuse the Son of God as the Lord lovingly sends Christ to us. What a solemn thing it is. Do you refuse him or do you reverence him? You know, Christ finished the parable by asking the question in verse 9. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? And then he proceeded to give the answer which everyone knew already. He will come and destroy the husband men and will give the vineyard unto others. And there you see their ruin finally. See, these husband men, they'd, they'd abused their responsibilities, they'd refused the patient, numerous warnings, they'd rebelled even to the point where they had slain their master's son. The only thing left for them, the only thing left rejecting even the master's son was destruction. The Lord of the vineyard would soon come to avenge. And having stated the conclusion, Christ immediately went on to apply it to those Jewish leaders and to their rejection of him. He quoted from Psalm 118, verse 22, the stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. I'm using the psalm there. He was the stone. Those Jewish leaders, the builders, had refused him. They had rejected him. And in consequence, God was soon going to destroy those husbandmen. And he would give the vineyard to others. The stone who they were rejecting, Christ, would become the headstone of the corner. That the chief stone in, if you like, a new building. And so it is. Because even think of how history has developed. The work of God goes on today. The gospel of Jesus Christ is still proclaimed. The religion that God established in Old Testament times that finds its fulfillment in New Testament times, it still is proclaimed. But those Jewish leaders aren't on the scene. Now certainly, don't get me wrong, there are Jews in the in the. Christian church. There are Jews who are saved by grace just as there are Gentiles. I'm not in any way taking Jews out of the picture here. 
But that system of Christ's day, that system of apostate Judaism, it's nowhere to be seen in terms of this godly religion. God has set it to the side. He destroyed it with the overthrow of the temple within a generation of Christ's day. They had rejected the Son of God and destruction was soon going to come. In fact, the next chapter of Mark's gospel, chapter 13, is going to go on to, to speak about that. It's going to be overthrown within a generation. They had rejected the Son of God, you see. Only disaster could follow. Now again, coming back to ourselves, what about you? Are you still rejecting Jesus Christ? It's very possible to be in a place like this, to have attended it regularly, many, many weeks in a row, over many years even, and still to be rejecting Christ. I can't see your heart. So I ask the question, are you still rejecting him? As the Lord who gave you your life, to whom you owe everything, whether you admit it or not, as he demands that you reverence the Son, Christ, are you doing so? Have you submitted to the Savior with a desire to serve him? Because if not, judgment is looming. Judgment is looming. If you reject the Son of God, destruction comes. Reject him. And there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's, there's none other place, no other place of refuge. Reject him. And all is lost. Christ came to give life, and he does give life to all who receive him. But reject him. And you're heaping judgment upon your head. I conclude with the words of John 3, 18, which sums it up. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Praise God for that. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Amen.